Hey, what's happening, everybody? It is Brent Axe. We are live here on the Syracuse Orange Football Facebook page, and we are chatting with you live following a 21-10 loss. The Syracuse football team loses at Heinz Field to Pittsburgh, a place that Syracuse football is now 1-9. They have not beaten Pittsburgh at Heinz Field since 2001. And what a... Uh, it was a brutal loss for Syracuse. There's really no other way to put it, as we'll discuss here. So you guys hop in the comments and do your thing. I'll kind of react to you as we go and a little bit later on here in the chat. But uh, we are here live. Uh, just a reminder that we're here after every Syracuse football game, thanks to our friends at Krause Health. And uh, make an appointment to join us after every Syracuse football game. We come on live yeah, about five or ten minutes after the game, depending on what's happening. And uh, we chat live with you. But if you miss it live, uh, we do archive it on YouTube for you. So look for that in my recap on Syracuse.com or on the Syracuse Orange Sports YouTube page. So Syracuse loses to Pittsburgh 21-10, to the final score at Heinz Field. And, folks, this is not hyperbole. I'm not trying to shake things up and, and say things just to say things and, and whatever the case may be. This offense for Syracuse is in crisis. We are two games into the season. And look, all things considered, they had a shortened uh, practice time during the offseason. They sat out, what, three or four practices during preseason camp over COVID testing procedures and concerns about that. We all know the year that we're in and, and what 2020 is. But in those same two games, this is a Syracuse defense that looks remarkably better. Tony White has come in, the new defensive coordinator for Syracuse. He has them playing not perfect certainly there's been some flaws on the defensive side of the ball but at the very least this defense has put the offense in position to win football games two weeks in a row last week against North Carolina Syracuse entered the fourth quarter down 10 to 7 North Carolina scored on the first play of the fourth quarter but even then you're only down by what 10 points or so if you had an average offense if you had a competent offense then you're in that football game the defense last week just flat out ran out of gas. North Carolina goes on to a 31-6 win. By men, football is football. You got to play the games. You got to execute. But what I think is a better roster top to bottom in Pittsburgh, it's the same deal. Syracuse goes into the fourth quarter in the football game. The defense is doing all that it can. It's handing opportunity after opportunity to the offense. And the offense is just, it's that, it's in crisis. Sterling Gilbert, the new offensive coordinator for the Syracuse football team, is running an uninspired offense. He's running an offense with play calling that absolutely befuddles me. And look, this is an offense that has its issues. We know the offensive line. Look, it is what it is at this point. It's just not good. It's not a good offensive line, so you got to find ways around it. But when you're running third and 10, for example, and Rex Culpepper in a quarterback today for Syracuse, as we'll discuss here, because now Syracuse has a quarterback. I wouldn't even use the term controversy, but they do have a quarterback situation for sure, as we'll discuss here. But, you know, it's third and 10. Rex Culpepper's in the game of quarterback, and you run a draw. You run a quarterback keep. I can give you several examples here of befuddling play calling from this offensive coordinator in third and long situations, in other situations, for the second week in a row, Aaron Hacken and Luke Benson, the tight ends for this team, not targeted. And if they were in this game, it was less than three or four times. I'm sorry, that is a joke. That is a flat-out joke. That is unacceptable. When you've got two tight ends that are talented, two tight ends that combined for nine touchdowns last year, and you got a quarterback who's struggling if it's Rex Culpepper or Tommy DeVito. you got a quarterback struggling to get the ball down the field, the offensive line breakdowns. Tell me again why you don't utilize the tight ends, even if they're in a blocking scheme that can kind of leak out four, five, six yards out. Get them the football. So there were some encouraging signs from the running game today. I mean, overall, we'll go over the stats here shortly. The stats were not good, but I think Sean Tucker – Gave that running game a little bit of a boost. Jawar Jordan ran with more of a purpose today. I think he's getting more comfortable as the lead back. But, folks, this is supposed to be orange is the new fast. This is supposed to be the strength of this team. This is supposed to be the identity of Syracuse football. And it is an offense stuck in the mud. It is an offense that is uninspiring. It is an offense that had its opportunities, by the way. Look, it's a four-quarter game. 
when you've got the ball in the first half, first quarter, really, but early possessions, once at the 35-yard line and another time at the 14-yard line, and you come out of that with three points, what more can I say about that? That's not good. Right. That's not good in a sense of a lot of things. Sometimes it's execution. Sometimes the defense just makes a play. You got to give credit to the pit defense in a lot of ways here. But you've got to get 14 points out of that, especially if you have an offense that is as ineffective, as uninspiring, as flat as this one is. That's where the frustration comes in, because this defense, which was Obviously a nightmare last year. They gave up 50 points more than three times. Dino Babers makes the complete philosophy change. And here, here's the irony with that, okay? Sterling Gilbert was brought in to run this offense because he had coached with Dino Babers before. He's in lockstep with Dino Babers' offense. You would think the continuity would be there on the offensive side of the ball. They've got a lot of players back. You thought Tommy DeVito was the guy. They lost Abdul Adams and Jarvie and Howard at running back. That's understandable. That's something that's got to be discussed. As bad as the offensive line was, you got four of five starters back on the line. And to be fair, they've had their injury issues. They're owies, as Dino Babers would put it, during training camp. Man, there's talent at wide receiver. Taj Harris was a little shaken up in this game, and we'll see if we can get an injury update on him as we go here. But Nikeem Johnson, Courtney Johnson, I mentioned the tight ends who are good in pass catching. There's talent on this offense. And Sterling Gilbert wants to come in and run this boring ball control, halfback dive on third and nine offense. Something's got to change if this team is going to be competitive because the defense has been great so far. The defense is doing all they can ask, but that was my point. So Gilbert was supposed to come in and just kind of keep things flowing. If anything, improve on it. Tony White completely remodeled the entire house Brought an entirely new defense to Syracuse, the 3-3-5. They've looked great the last two weeks. Now, that could be opponents are getting used to it. They're not, there's not a lot of film on it. And it's maybe when, uh, uh, you know, good offensive coordinators, good opposing coaches catch up on it, maybe that won't be the case. But for right now, Syracuse's defense is absolutely doing enough to keep the offense in this game. That is the frustration level there. So uh, I, I do have good news for you. Syracuse covered the, the 20 and a half point spread. But that's pretty much the only good news that comes out of this one other than some things on defense. Let's look at some numbers. And it really tells the tale here. Pitt had 23 first downs to Syracuse's 10. Syracuse ran the ball 34 times for 51 yards. That's an average of 1.5 yards per carry. Pitt, 44 carries for 127 yards. Uh, Syracuse... All told, ran 58 plays for 178 yards. They're averaging less than three yards a play, not only in this game, but this season. That's obviously not good. Pittsburgh ran 80 plays for 342 yards. And speaking of which, you know, this is an offense that wants to run 70, 75 plays a game. Orange is the new fast, high pace, high octane offense. It is anything but that. Like I said, this team has an identity crisis on offense. They're trying to be something they're not. And they're going to have to take a good, hard look at that. They're going to have to have a go over the numbers here, but they're going to have to take a good, hard look at the quarterback position. I'm sorry, Tommy DeVito has not put a grapple hold on this job. And I'm the first to admit, when Tommy DeVito came in on that North Carolina game two years ago, I I, I was, how can I put this? I, I was swooning after that. I thought he was the quarterback. Eric Dungey proved us wrong then. But even when Tommy DeVito got the opportunity last year, now he was banged up, to be fair. And, again, I keep coming back to the offensive line because it has to be mentioned. There was one sack today, amongst many, because DeVito got sacked, again, a lot, where Rashad Weaver, back on the field for the first time in two years, by the way, just flat out ran around Aaron Service. Aaron Service is a pretty good left tackle, by the way. So there's nothing Tommy DeVito or Rex Culpepper can do about that. But – Still, when they have time to throw the football, it's a mixture of bad play calling, bad decision making, and it's just, I keep coming back, it's just uninspiring. You just don't get the sense that this offense is sure of itself and doing what it can, whereas the defense right now looks great and is playing freely and confident, getting used to the new scheme. There's talent there. There's some emerging. Stephon Thompson, I think, had a great game today, a freshman a linebacker who's getting pressure on the quarterback. Andre Sisko, of course, was great. Ify Melanfano. Michael Jones, the linebacker, had another interception today. It's funny how one coordinator has come in and like that, 
the defense looks a lot better where the offense is taking steps backwards. But to continue with the numbers here, I mean, I'm just kind of rubbing salt in the wound at this point, right? When you look at third down, Syracuse was 2 of 14 on third down. And when you're in constant third and 9, third and 10, third and 11, if you can't give yourself third and short, Syracuse threw the ball, I'm pretty sure, every time on second down today, if not frequently. They were not running the ball as much on first down in what was described by Coach Babers as RPO situations, the run-pass option where the quarterback has the choice to either run the football or step out of it and pass the ball. Either way, 2 of 14 on third down. And again, when it's third and 10 and you're running the quarterback, you're not throwing to the tight end. You're not even making an effort to get the ball at the sticks. I mean, what are we doing here? What are we – it's just – it's – it's. I can feel the frustration from the fans. I felt it on Twitter during the game, uh, certainly on my radio program through the week, and it's only going to get worse because – the fact of the matter is this team could be 2-0 and right now. At the very least, at the very least, they should be 1-1. One and one. They had this game. This is another game that they were in. If they converted those early turnovers, Pitt, good team. And, you know, it was a back-and-forth game. But this is a Pitt team that won 55-0 last week. Now, that was Austin P. That was an FCS team. You don't put too much into that. But this is a team that Syracuse has struggled with. And there's been close games with, and it was another somewhat close game, but it was another situation where it's 21-10 with, what, 10 minutes to go, and you're like, it's over. And that should not be the case, given the offense that you have that, in theory, is supposed to, you know, to take a term from Cobra Kai, strike fast, strike hard, no mercy serve. Yeah, n- absolutely not the case when it comes to the Syracuse offense right now. So uh, those are some of the team numbers here, just to look at things on an individual basis. Tommy DeVito, who was shaken up in this game, he took some helmet-to-helmet contact, sat out a lot of the end of the first half, was overall 9 of 15 for 32 yards, throwing the football, one interception. Rex Culpepper comes in, throws the first touchdown of his career, 69 yards, nice, right? We know the story of Rex Culpepper overcame cancer, what a kid he is, what a story he is, and now it looks like he's going to have an opportunity to be the starting quarterback of his team, which I didn't see coming. I really didn't, because let's let's be honest here, if Rex Culpepper was this good, he would have beaten out DeVito by now. He'd be on the field, right? If, if Rex truly was that good, he'd be on the field right now. So I'm a little skeptical of that, because Rex has his issues too. There was a sideline throw when Syracuse was driving down the field, fourth and sixth, he airmailed a pass, I, I believe, on the same possession, but uh, certainly airmailed a pass to the sideline. Rex has accuracy issues, okay? Hey, beautiful deep ball. Taj Harris, the touchdown, uh, a nice shake and bake play at the end, shook off a couple defenders. And that it, that just adds insult to injury in a way because it shows there's talent at wide receiver on this team. But they're out there on an island by themselves, wondering when the rescue boat's going to come, right? They're sitting on the raft and Wilson is floating away and there's nothing they can do about it. It's it's just, it's maddening to watch. So, look, I am not opposed to Rex Culpepper starting next week. I'd like to see what he gets with first team reps. But again, folks, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a team that doesn't have a quarterback. Their other options are quarterback or freshmen. And they are raw, just out of the package freshmen. You want to put them behind this offensive line? We may get to that point if this offense can't improve. But it's not time for either one of the the younger freshmen that Syracuse brought in to get in yet, but uh, you better get them reps and you better get them ready at this point. Georgia Tech comes in next week, and perhaps that team's better than the team that was picked to finish last in the ACC. I think it's fitting in a way. There'll be no fans at the Dome next week. Honestly, who wants to watch a team like that if that's the kind of offense that you're going to be handed? They've got to make marked improvement here somehow. Dino Babers, who I saw on the field after the game was having an on-field meeting, pretty passionate on-field meeting. Look, there's nine games to go, but it's getting late early, as the great Yogi Berra would say. Uh, On the receiving end, we mentioned Taj Harris, three catches for 72 yards, but most of that came on the 69-yard touchdown. Anthony Queeley, three catches for 18 yards. Courtney Jackson, three catches for 15, just nothing here. And the tight ends, not in the stat sheet. That's just, I'm sorry, that's just a joke. Uh, Jawar Jordan, 13 carries for 40 yards. I like Sean Tucker, the freshman. I think he gave that running game a little bit of a pop, and I'd like to see him get some more opportunities. Four carries for 23 yards on the day. Defensively, you know, we mentioned how good Syracuse was on defense. I mean, they did their job. They did enough. I was impressed with Stephon Thompson. 
who uh, got some pressure on the quarterback. He had a sack today. Um, just glancing over the uh, defensive stats here to see what else stands out. Uh, Trill Williams, another great game for Syracuse. He had eight tackles on the day. We mentioned Cisco, eight tackles on the day. Michael Jones was terrific. Uh, five tackles had the interception as well. So there's a few names that stand out. That's what stands out statistically. Let's see what uh, stands out to you guys and gals as you're chatting with us here. And I'll start react, uh, reacting to some of the things you're mentioning here. Blake mentions Brent watching from Houston. Appreciate that, Blake. That's what I love about doing this chat. We hear from Syracuse fans from all over the world, really, uh, mostly in the United States, but all over the world, wherever you're watching today. Thank you for that and spending part of your Saturday afternoon with us. Uh, Blake wants to know, if uh, Axe, do you think DeVito can excel in Dino's system? My answer is no. I don't think so. I mean, we'd know at this point. Tommy DeVito had the best apprenticeship you can have. He sat behind DeVito for a couple of years. They gave him time, got in that. Remember that first Western Michigan game they started the season with splitting time with Dungy? Certainly got in for Dungy a lot when Dungy was hurt all of last season when you think about the big moments Syracuse had last year. DeVito was not a part of them. He beat Western Michigan, had a nice game there. But the Duke game, 49-6, he, he, he was 6 of 15 in that game. That was all defense. The game at the end of the season, Wake Forest that Syracuse won, that was one on a defensive play, first of all. But even the offensive success in that game, Clayton Welch was the quarterback in that game. So my answer is no. I, I just don't see it. And I don't see how this is going to improve with – what Sterling Gilbert's trying to do with this offense. Can you tell I'm not a fan of, of Gilbert and his system at this point? I'll be fair. I'll give him an opportunity to turn this around. There's nine games to go. He's two games into his tenure as offensive coordinator, but this has been rough so far. And you got a, you got a defensive coordinator on the other side that's made an instant impact. As uh, Blake also notes there, by the way, uh, kudos to Tony White on the great hire. Can't say the same about Gilbert at this point. Uh, John says, terrible, terrible, bad coaching all around. The offensive line continues to regress. TD, Tommy DeVito, can't make a play. Wide receivers dropping balls, not looking back. I'll tell you what, that first or offensive series or two were actually pretty good. Now, that's in the scripted plays portion, portion of the game, and that's when Tommy's not thinking he's just playing. Once Tommy has to think a little bit, he has to react, run the RPO, and again, sometimes – he doesn't have time to do anything because the pocket collapses, but that's it. That's what we see, third and nine, and the pocket collapses, and he gets sacked. This is on the quarterback, too. You can't just point at the offensive line and blame it all on them. DeVito's decision-making, his pocket awareness, he just doesn't have it. His clock, his, you know, you think about that clock that quarterbacks talk about all the time, that internal clock that's ticking once the ball is snapped. He just doesn't have it. Now, again, Rex Culpepper doesn't overwhelm me, but – what has Tommy DeVito done for us to say that Rex should not get a shot? He hasn't. That that bottom line, he hasn't at this point. I'm just going off the results now. You gotta at some point it's gonna stop being about potential and arm strength and everything for Tommy DeVito. And it's about uh, as Ray Stance once said in the great movie Ghostbusters, I, I worked in the private sector. They expect results, right? Uh Jim says one touchdown in eight quarters, totally unacceptable. You are absolutely right about that. Uh, my man, Daryl, good to see Daryl saying, X, uh, WTH, did Dino do down the stretch, not using his three timeouts? It's almost like he quit. I absolutely see what you're saying there, but they were not in that game. I mean, you could just see it. You could just feel it. Sean says, Brent, it's not Gilbert. Call out Dino like you should. I think I have. I think certainly this is on Dino, but I'm wondering how much, it's Dino calling the plays versus Sterling Gilbert calling the plays. Does Dino take over the play calling? You know, we're going to have to see about that. I'm not quite sure what the disparity is, but of course Dino gets some of the blame here. But at the same time, to be fair, Dino hired Tony White, and the results so far, two games in, but so far have been pretty darn good. Uh, Tyler says there's no point in having a newscast on this team. All you have to say is that the defense is decent, the offense stinks, the play calling stinks, DeVito's got to go, and they may not even need a new head coach. It's that simple. I wish my job was that simple, Tyler, right? But uh, they, as I just said, uh, my my bosses expect results. So I'm going to have to write a little bit more than that. You're not wrong, by the way, but uh, we'll give you a little more detail than that. Um, a lot of you uh, commenting about Coach Babers, and it's tough because it's a pandemic season. 
we mentioned all the lack of preparation in the off season and the unique circumstance that they were put in here. But if this team keeps sliding down the hill like this and they only win two or three football games this year, just to throw that out, that is an example. I mean, at the very least, he's going to be on the hot seat, right? A lot of you uh, mentioning what Daryl mentioned about quitting on the team, not using the timeouts, not playing at the end. I, I can't defend that. It's one of those, there's a great line from Chris Rock where he, he had in one of his uh, stand-ups when it's like, uh, boy, I just had it in my head and I lost it. But it was basically like, I don't agree, but I understand, right? I could see why Dino did that, but I could see why fans would get on him for that. I can't defend that. I can't defend just, yeah, just pack it up and go. But what did the offense show that you could use those timeouts, use your razzle-dazzle, use whatever the case may be to get back in that game? I mean, they were done. They were cooked, and they could see it, and they knew it. Doesn't look good. I can't disagree with you there. But um, who's the third string quarterback from William? Yeah, we might get there at this point. They've got Dylan Markowitz, who's a freshman, and that's really it. Like, that's, I believe David Summers is still on the roster. I'd have to double check myself there. But their, their first two quarterbacks, you're trying to figure out who's, who's the better of the two at this point. We thought it was DeVito. The results just aren't there. I like Rex, but I got to see it, right? I've seen some flashes from Rex. That throw was great. But there's something about, as we know with Tommy DeVito, when the backup quarterback comes in and he's not thinking and he's just playing, but once he settles in a little bit, has to start reading defenses, has to start doing things the quarterbacks do, they settle in. And Rex had a couple of really bad throws in this game too. So to be fair, you know, you got to check it out. Uh, Kevin checking in from uh, Georgia. Thank you for that, sir. It says pandemic season, but the other teams had the same lack of preparation. Thanks for doing these. Uh, thanks for watching, Kevin. Appreciate that. That's fair. That's absolutely fair. There's some teams out there that had the same lack of springtime, same lack of preparation. And, you know, perhaps as time goes here and they're playing football, we'll, we'll, not that we'll forget about the pandemic. That's kind of impossible at this point, but results speak for themselves. And like we said, the defense had that lack of time and they look great. They look, and those are two good teams Syracuse just played. It's not like, let's go, let's just in, in theory say Syracuse had their regular schedule and they started with Boston College and Rutgers, who are two teams that are not very good. And they look this good. You'd be skeptical, right? North Carolina and Pittsburgh are good teams. North Carolina is going to be in the hunt to, they can't play this weekend because of a COVID situation uh, with Charlotte. So uh, they're uh, postponed this weekend. But if they play out, the way the schedule goes, they could be in the hunt for the ACC championship game. Pittsburgh's the same way. Pittsburgh's a good team. So the defense has done this against two good teams, two good quarterbacks. Sam Howell is one of the better quarterbacks in the ACC. Kenny Pickett is a terrific quarterback who's been around, senior, four-year guy. Defenses look good. So per your point about the lack of preparation time, well, that hasn't affected the defense. But again, to be fair, I think opposing offenses are looking at that 3-3-5, and they're not familiar with it. And I think Tony White is riding that as far as he could go. But, hey, good for him because it's used. Uh, it's certainly been used to their advantage at this point. Rob asks, we're missing a few guys on the offensive line. How big of a difference is that making? How different would the results be if they were playing? That's a great question because even the veteran players that were in, I mentioned Aaron Service, he got ran around today. Carlos Federello had a couple penalties today. Uh, so if you had uh, Dakota Davis in at left guard, for example, if they the thing that really stung Syracuse, Rob, per your question, is the Florida transfer, Chris Blight. The NCAA denying him his waiver is an absolute joke, and I don't have all the details of it, and no two cases are the same, but I saw player after player after player get their transfer waivers approved. And Chris Blake did not. And I want to know what the NCAA's reasoning for that is. It shouldn't even be a thing, by the way. It should, they, they should be able to transfer and go where they want to go. But the fact that Chris Blake got denied, that's a player. That's an eight-time starter at Florida last year. And I think, Rob, to answer your question, he would make a difference. But he'd make a difference on a, a, a play-calling situation that's uninspiring and a, an offense that's struggling in many ways right now. So it would help. Don't get me wrong. Would it be the magic elixir they're looking for? Maybe not. We shall see. All right. I think we're going to end it there uh, for today, ladies and gents. I really appreciate you coming by as always. Uh, same uh, bat time next week. Syracuse kicks off at noon 
against Georgia Tech. By the way, tomorrow, September 20th, is the 40th anniversary of the Carrier Dome. Can you believe that? Uh, if you're locally here in Syracuse, um, I'm going to have an article that's going to be in the Sunday newspaper. It's up on Syracuse.com now. We ranked in chronological order the 40 biggest games in Carrier Dome history, and that's for all Syracuse athletics, all five of the teams that call the Dome their home, and that's football, men's basketball, women's basketball, men's and women's lacrosse. So if that's up on Syracuse.com now. I hope you guys can check that out. Uh, tomorrow, 40th anniversary of the Dome. Can you believe it? And next week, Syracuse will play its first game in Dome 2.0, the new roof, the new look. We'll see what that new scoreboard's like. But no fans will be in the building to see it, barring a last-minute reprieve from Governor Cuomo. So we'll meet again next week after Syracuse plays Georgia Tech. In the meantime, thanks to our friends at Krause Health. Thanks to you for watching today. Syracuse falls to Pittsburgh 21-10. They're 0-2 on the season. And uh, Lucy, we got some big problems on the offense. We'll see what Dino Baber, Sterling Gilbert, and company do to fix that. Have a great rest of your weekend, everybody.